so good to see so many of you here. We pray that God's word through Proverbs will give you another level of blessing and understanding in what God is trying to say to us. And so we'll pray for all of you and pray for the word this morning. Uh, let's have a brief word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day, for it is the day that you have made, and you've called us to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for this topical, deductive study of the book of Proverbs. We pray that it will encourage your people, strengthen their immune system, and remind them of their calling before you. We thank you for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So good to see you. You should have some handouts that give you a brief outline of our study. Basically, uh, we're doing an outline study. This is not an in-depth study of the book of Proverbs. We got six weeks, and we try to go through 31 of those chapters and do it some type of justice. So we'll be kind of moving ahead in this. And uh, we're going to do a little review. And you remember some of the things that we've already discussed from last week, our first lesson, is that we talked about Proverbs being basically meaning sayings, basic sayings. These are sayings of Solomon, uh, who is the son of David. These are basic sayings. But it is written from a point of view of a man who was flawed. Remember last week we, we said that Solomon is a flawed man. Uh, what a flawed family. It was a whole messed up culture going on in their home life. And yet out of that, that confusion of that home life of David and Bathsheba, uh, the death of a, his younger brother because of the sins of uh, his mother and father, this man, Solomon, writes over 3,000 proverbs, wisdoms to, to speak and to teach us. So out of this, his life comes this perfection of, of proverbs to help bless us with common sense understandings. Proverbs, as we said last week, is in the poetic division of the Old Testament. Uh, there's five books in the poetry area. One of them is Job, that's considered in the poetry section. Uh, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes is part of that. But also the Song of Solomon, or as some uh, translations they use the Song of Songs. So those are kind of like the five books in this poetic category of the scriptures. You can memorize them by the, using the acrostic J-P-P-E-S, if you want to know where they are. Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Psalms. So it's J.P. Pez. I used to say it in my old church. J.B. Pez. That's how we remember that particular uh, portion of the poetry books. Job answers the question, why do we suffer? Psalms answers the question, how shall we worship? Ecclesiastes, as we said last week, uh, deals with how do I deal with depression and sadness in my life. The Song of Solomon uh, deals with how do I deal with intimacy in my marriage. I did a whole seminar just on the Song of Solomon years ago about the intimacy in the relationship in the marriage. And then, you know, Proverbs deals with how should I live? And so we're looking at how do we live in a world that's constantly giving us a lot of information and knowledge? Because Proverbs is about wisdom. Knowledge is about information. So that wisdom is, is how do we, we handle the knowledge that's given us. We're in the information stage. Everything is coming our way through Google, through, through social networking. We have a lot of information, but we don't know how to apply it. 
and we don't know how to use it in a way that builds up a nation and builds up a home. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, there may be some controversial things that I may be saying. You take it and you chew it and you figure out what you want to do with that. The key verse we said last week of Proverbs is chapter 9, verses 11, 10 and 11. Here's what it says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And through wisdom, your days will be added to your life. Isn't that amazing? That, that uh, wisdom will add to your life. Years. Some of us have more years to our life, and some is more life to our years. Wisdom helps us to avoid the traps of life, the traps, the booby traps that we don't have to go through. And so basically, Proverbs, as we said, will, will help us to deal with fools, helps us to, to deal with haters, angry people, how to deal with adultery in people's lives, how to deal with very self-centered people, how do you handle bad decisions, lazy people. We'll see things like metaphors, as we said last week, words that represent something else or something called personifications, things that represent people. For example, in, in, even in Psalms, it says that he shall be like a tree. The personification there is the tree and the, and the person. The tree is symbolizing the person. The tree represents the strength of that person. The personification, tree and person. He shall be like a tree. We see a lot of that in Proverbs also. We'll look into comparison and contrast, as we said last week. Remember we said in Proverbs 15.1, we said what? A gentle answer turns away what? Wrath. But what? Harsh words stirs up anger. Comparison and contrast there is what? It is gentle and harsh. Proverbs is written in these things called couplets. Couplets. C-O-U-P-L-E-T-S. Couplets. There's two sentences, very short, condensed sentences that explains a whole lot just in a short period of time. This is what Proverbs does. Okay? So that was kind of the background of that, of what we said last week. Again, our goal is to strengthen your spiritual immune system. We know that there are physical immune systems that helps fight off germs that we can't see, all kinds of viruses. That are the strength of our immune system, our, our white blood cell count has to be strong enough to fight against that. Well, in the same way in the Bible, it gives us strengthening our white blood cells spiritually to fight against forces that we see and don't see. So our goal is to build your system up. Again, you will be challenged on some ways in your beliefs and, your, uh, and some of your thinking uh, during our time. We'll talk about, what, generosity and greed this morning. We'll talk about a home life. We'll talk about uh, husband and wife, our children. We're going to be delving into those subjects. Again, not in detail. Uh, that's another section that we'll be doing. But we'll be looking deductively or topically into these areas and finding out proverbs that supports that. For example, we'll be looking into proverbs, uh, the, looking into the area of generosity and greed, for example. Okay? That, that is basically giving and taking. Generosity and greed. Giving and taking. It's a really a, a, a difference in misplaced values misplaced values, and misplaced priorities. For example, the Gospel of Matthew in 7 says, Seek ye first, what? His kingdom and his, what? Righteousness, and all these things shall be added. Well, God has nothing, there's no problem with things. He wants you to have things. He wants you to have a nice house, a nice car, and clothes. But when it is misplaced, and when the priorities are off, that's where the problem is. That's why he says, what? Seek ye first. It's the principles of the first. There is a whole lesson that I do on the principles of the first. But this is one of them. The principles of the first. It is 
getting your priorities lined up. Now, there are some characteristics of greed that Proverbs talks about. Um, one of them is that it's insatiable. You know what insatiable means, right? You never get enough. It's insatiable. Proverbs 27, verse 20 says what? Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are human eyes. Now, think about that. Death and destruction are never satisfied, neither are the human eyes. Your eyes are what? The gateway into things that you think you want. What you see on the Internet, what you see in the magazines, what you see in other people, it becomes insatiable. You'll never have enough. God is, is trying to guard you against this desire to always want something, always trying to accumulate more things. There's a psychologist uh, who had spent years into the Nazi concentration camp. His name is Viktor Frankl. Many of you may know of Viktor Frankl, who have studied uh, psychology. psychiatry. Um, years ago in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, he states that when a man cannot find purpose and meaning, what does he do? He will distract himself with pleasure. He will distract himself with pleasure. What they possess, pleasure. Women, men, uh, constantly accumulating things. This desire to have more and to always have pleasure. Okay? Uh, there was a song, I think, by the OJs years ago. I think it was the OJs. It's called Living for the Weekend. Is that, that, and they're just living for the weekend. I just can't wait to work these 40 hours so I can just party all weekend. So it is that insatiable desire for pleasure. Pleasure. And so Proverbs is trying to guard us against this insatiable desire. We see it all around us. Remember we talked about the, in Matthew chapter 7, uh, the rich man. The rich man was rich because he kept building more bonds. It's not that God don't want you to be rich. It's what you do with it. He wanted more barns to be built. In other words, he, he, all the, he maxed out what he could put in one bank, so he go to another bank to max that out. Most banks you can give maybe, no, you can save no more than $250,000 in there uh, and yet still be insured, FDIC. You know, you got about 10 or 15 banks. There are people just got banks all over the place. And they're not using it for the kingdom, the bill. So he, this rich man, he kept building more barns, more bank accounts. Money's hid all in his house, in boxes and shoe boxes. Just all over the place. I remember Lady Frances and I, we, a long time ago, we visited Fort Lauderdale, and we went along the intercoastal there. And we would always go use what's called the water taxi. We would just kind of, you know, just drive you along that uh, little river area there. And along the river banks area there, there were houses on either side. Filthy, wretched people. Filthy rich people. I mean, these homes are starting at 20 or $30 million. I mean, you have to wash up after you finish riding on this water top. I mean, it's just filthy rich. One man who owned, who had owned at that time, the Miami Dolphins had a $40 million house that he tore down to build another house for $60 million. These houses are about the size of, and I kid you not, museums with one, two, or three people living in them. One man had a boat. I'm not going to even call it a boat. It was a cruise ship along the canal. Hundred million dollars. He was the owner of a software company. He hires a, a full-time uh, captain for $100,000 a year. He only used, the person said he only uh, used this ship two or three times a year. It's crazy. This insatiable desire, greed and generosity. But also it could be greed in terms of being miserly. And it's not always about having extravagant lives. You know, we had a person on our block uh, years ago as a child. He was an attorney, and he lived very miserly. I mean, he had basic, I mean, he was an attorney, 
but you would think that he was a street bum. He kept all his cash in his house. He didn't, you know, he just lived on the, I mean, below the level. He, he was just, I mean, it's amazing. There are people who just have, just, just live way below their income, don't spend nothing, but they're saving. That's just as bad as those who have a lot. The Bible says that those people who live like that, extravagant or miserly, in Proverbs 11, they bring ruin upon themselves. In other words, there is a consequence to that kind of behavior. Bring ruin. But generosity is amazing because what you do with generosity, according to Proverbs 14, is that you, you, you're caring for the needy, those who have less than you have. Uh, uh, Proverbs 3, 28 says, don't put off helping the needy. Proverbs 14, 3 says, uh, being generous honors the Lord. Proverbs 28, verse 27 says, we are to give liberally. It says there in Proverbs 28, 27, that those who give to the poor will lack nothing. This is the promise God's making to us. But those who close their eyes to them receive what? Many curses. You walk past a lot of these people. God says there's a consequence to how you treat them. So God has a response to generosity. Proverbs 22 says the generous will be blessed when they share with those who have not. Again, the purpose of money, here is the purpose of money. If you, got, you can write this down. I call it the 10, 10, 10, 70 plan. It used to be 10, 10, 80, but I've changed it to 10, 10, 10, 70 plan. Is number one, is to give. Number two, to save. Number three, to invest. Number four, to spend. That was what you live on. So 10% of what you give, 10% of what you save, 10% of what you invest, and 70% of what you spend. If you draw a box and you have four squares, put 10, 10, 10, 70. That helps you to pull perspective together. God's saying, live on the 70% of what you earn and see how I will turn that 70% into 100%, to 140%. But he wants the priority. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, that's generosity and greed. I'm hoping I can get through this lesson. Number two, we're going to look at home life. Home life, home life. Proverbs tells us something about home life I want you to understand. The Bible tells us in, in Proverbs 15, verses 6, he says, in the house of the righteous, there is much treasure. But in the revenue of the wicked, there is trouble. We see a couplet there, don't we? What the, what's the couplet? What, what's the comparison and contrast there? What? Righteous, right? And what's the other one? Wicked. There are, there are, there are behavior differences between the righteous and the wicked. The house of the righteous, there is what? Much treasure. But the revenue of the wicked is what? Trouble. So you got treasure and you got trouble in this couplet here. That's the home life. So that the purpose of a home is unity to create and build unity and the happiness of each of the members of the house, according to Proverbs 5, verse 18. Training is a train, number two is a training ground for children according to Proverbs 22, verse 6. You know, train up a child the way they should go. It's a, a, a training ground to help them to understand what discipline is, to learn their values, what's important and what's not important. And again, loving discipline. Parents modeling godly behavior in front of their children. Again, they watch more of what you do than what? what you say, right? Remember the time we used to have just one telephone in the house? Now everybody got a phone. Even your, your kindergarten child got a phone. Everybody 
has a phone. But when I was growing up, there was one phone in the house with a long string to it. And only one person answered that phone. Either your mother or your father answered the phone, unless they told you to answer the phone. I know it seems kind of strange to some of y'all now, but, you know, it was one phone. Either it was, it was sitting on the table or it was hanging on the wall. Okay? Now, now you, can, you can teach your child some behaviors back then that may not be good. For example, if the phone rings and your mother or father tells you to do what? Pick up the phone. I'm kind of, and tell them, whoever's on the phone, tell them that I'm not home. Oh, y'all laughing because you all know what happened. T tell them that, what? I'm not home. In other words, you didn't want to be bothered, or your mother and father didn't want to be bothered. So, but what are, you, what are you teaching your child, though? You're teaching them to lie. And yet, in the day, we'll say, well, I never taught my child how to lie. I don't know where they get that from. They're picking up cues from you and I on what we say and what we do what we say and what we do, okay? So Proverbs describes the, 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 the worth and the value of a home. It is man's most precious possession, according to Proverbs 24, verse 3. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, but by wisdom, what? A house is built, and through understanding, it is established. His rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasure. Can you imagine a house like that? His rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Not just the things in your house, but it's the values. It is the beliefs. It is what you teach your child. The home, the sense of peace. I, I remember Lady Frances and I had bought a home uh, years ago, and it was uh, the basement was unfinished. And we said, we're gonna, one day we're going to finish the basement up. And, uh, and, and the time came for us to, to kind of, you know, we got a contractor, and, and they're going to put the rug down there and, you know, all kinds of stuff down there looking really nice. I said, well, you know, before we do that, uh, let's put something underneath the carpet before they come. And so we took an old Bible that had never been used. It was, you know, and we just tore out the chapters of each of the 66 books, and we spread them on the concrete on the bottom, all over that basement. And then we had the contractor lay the carpet on top of it so that the house, in one sense, would have a foundation of the Word of God. That was the idea. And when we go down there, I'm like, I kid you not, it was so peaceful. When we have Bible studies down there, we have just reading and just time together. It was just peaceful. Just a, uh, we'll, I would just go down there just to meditate. That is rare and it's precious to be in a house of peace. That is what Proverbs describes the home. It's a, it's a, it's a place of, 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 of peace, of coordination. Everyone is doing something that contributes to the health and the wealth of that home. That's home life. We talked about the home life. We talked about what? The uh, being generous, all right, and being greedy, all right? The third area is husband and wives. Husband and wife. I want you to kind of write this down. We're going to get into more controversial stuff here. Husband and wives. And um, now, according to... Uh, the book of Luther, not the book of Luke, but the book of Luther. He says that a room is not a room, even when there's nothing but gloom. But a room is not a house, and a house is not a home when the two of us are far apart. And one of us has a broken heart. Boo, 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 boo. <laughs> oh, I wish I could sing like Luther. I wish I could just. <laughs> but godly homes just don't happen. It, it's intentional. It, the, you know, it's, it's built by the hands of spouses who follow the wisdom of God, according to Proverbs 15, 17. 
For example, with husbands, it says good husbands in Proverbs 20, verse 6, are rare. Good husbands are rare. So in, in, in Proverbs 20, it says, many claim to have unfailing love, but a faithful person, faithful man, who can you find? It's hard to find one. Hard to find a good man. Isn't that right, ladies? I saw a quote the other day, and you may want to write this down. You may want to write it down. It says, one of the purest forms of love is trying to fix themselves so that they can love you exactly the way you deserve to be loved. Wow. I'm going to read that again. Y'all didn't, didn't pick up on that. Y'all didn't pick up. One of the purest forms of love is when someone is trying to fix themselves or adjust themselves so that they can love you exactly the way you deserve to be loved. Lord, have mercy. That's love. Love is, love is action. It's not just saying, I love you. Now, it's, it's doing something. Now, it will be 40 years this coming October that my wife and I have been married. 40 years. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine somebody putting up with me for 40 years? I mean, that's, that's amazing. But we're still learning from each other. Learning. We're, we're still growing. You would think after 40 years that we know everything that, uh, that needs to be learned. We know a lot, but we don't know a whole lot. Because Why? Because we are, all of us, are constantly changing. All the time. She used to didn't like bananas. Now she's crazy about them. I said, why didn't you start eating bananas like this? Every morning, bananas. So we're, 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 we're learning and because at the same time we're growing. So we have to continue to be in communication to find out where the adjustments are, to figure out how to embrace each other in a way that we deserve to be, and be embraced. But even though it may be hard to find a good man, but it's also the greatest treasure of a man is a wife. In Proverbs 18, 22, it says, who can find a good wife? And what is good and find favors from the Lord? Proverbs is saying, you find you a good woman, you found favor. You, <laughs> you found favor from the Lord. If you, if you find you a good woman, a good woman, okay? Good woman knows how to treat a good man. Now, there are troublesome husbands, okay? Proverbs 11, verse 29 says, He, whoever brings ruin on their family will inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise. In other words, inherit the wind. There was a movie called Inherit the Wind. The, the idea of bringing trouble into the home. Certain men and women, but the men in particular, if you're not careful, will bring, bring trouble to the wind, to, to, to the home. You need to really be careful about who you marry. That there was a well-known entertainer the other day. He had, you know, he has a wife, he has two adopted children. He said he just turned 50. And he said you want to just be honest with people and honest with the people because people want to get down on him because he said that now he is a pansexual. Now, I don't want to get too deep into this, because I know how some of y'all may feel about this, but let me just tell you something about a pansexual. That is a person who believes he's neither male nor female. In other words, they use the word binary to describe themselves. So they, they have sex with men and women. So I said to myself, what did your wife say about this? Your children. He is beginning to bring some issues into the home. So one of the things I do uh, when I'm not in church, I, I counsel couples, and I counsel couples who want to get married. And I have 39 questions of which they have to go through over a period of time and just counsel a couple the other day. And uh, I said, I'm, I'm asking you some hard questions here because, you know, you are a little bit older than the average person that wants to get, get married. 
You've accumulated a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that have gone on. You've had past relationships. So I'm, I'm being hard on you. They say, yeah, I understand. Because you need to know who you're marrying. Now, I know y'all knew each other in high school and all that, but this is not the same guy. This is not the same woman. You've had a lot of other experiences up to this point. The Bible talks about a person in 1 Samuel 25. Do you ever get a chance? I don't have time to really delve into this. This is like a whole lesson by itself. It speaks of a man named Nabal. I don't know if you know about this man named Nabal, uh, but his wife, whose name was Abigail, okay? The Bible says Abigail was a, a beautiful and intelligent woman. Now, she should have known something about Nabal. Because, you know, there are always cues about who you marry before you marry. Nabal, the very name Nabal means what? A fool. She didn't catch a cue. You would meet a couple of you one year. He's like, how did they get together? Like, what is she doing with him? You know, now he had a lot of money and she had the beauty. So I don't know what was going on there, but he was a rich man. And the Bible says he was what? In 1 Samuel 25, he was surly and he was harsh. That's what, that's what they described Nabal. He was surly and he was harsh. When we say the word surly, it means what? It means that he was mean in his dealings. Mean in his dealings, and which means in his tone and his abusive behavior. Now, I wouldn't be surprised in that home with this beautiful, intelligent woman that he was abusive to her verbally. Where's my dinner? Where are you going? Just the tone. Sometimes it's not just what you say. It's how you say it. The Bible says he was mean in his dealings with her. Just one. How did these two people get together? You know, so it was, it was crazy. You know, just, you, know, you know, by the way, don't just marry someone because you met in church. I often say, I read somewhere that a church is like a hospital. Not all patients are responding to treatment. <laughs> Not all of them. We're here. We're trying to get healed. It is a hospital. Trying to get healed. There are things, there are wounds that we're still dealing with, past relationships. Wounds are being hurt. You're trying to figure out what God is saying. So Nabal was a very mean man. And you, you ought to read the story because he did something crazy in that household. He put that household in danger. He put that house, we'll talk a little bit later about what happened, what did Abigail do? But, but he put that house in danger because that house is getting ready to be destroyed because of his behavior. Just keep your eyes open. But the wives, you have the power, women have the power to stabilize or to destroy your home. Proverbs 14, 1, it says, a wise woman builds, but with her own hands, the foolishness one, or the foolish one, does what? Tears it down. So you have the ability to build a house, and yet you can tear it down at the same time. Proverbs 12, verse 4 says, you can make or break your husband. Okay? Or you can be your husband's crown, as it says there. Women, generally speaking, are more verbal than the man or the husband. So you have, I mean, you, you say 100 words, and he can say it in maybe one sentence. You have the, 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 the vocabulary and, and the word power to destroy and to demean a man just by your response to him, right? The Bible says a disgraceful wife is like decay to his bones. That's what Proverbs says. She's like decay to his bones. Your words can lift up again or tear down. You don't understand the power of not just what you say, but the tone of what you say. Men has the strength in general, but the women have the verbosity, the wording to destroy. So be careful, okay? But also it says the woman, in Proverbs 19, verse 13, can be contentious. 
Again, you can build a home or destroy it. The Bible says in Proverbs 19, verse 13, that a quarrelsome wife is like what? It's like drippings from a leaking roof. You ever had a leaking roof? Just irritating. Just drip, 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 drip. This is what Solomon's talking about. Irritating. That's why some men go into their man cave, whatever that is, just to get away from noise. So this is the problem, okay? But a worthy woman, all right, the worthy woman, it says in verse 31, verse 10, who can find? A worthy woman, she's worth more than rubies. Number two, her worth is more than anything. The Bible says, uh, until um, Adam found Eve, he was incomplete, according to Genesis 2, verse 18. God gave him an assignment to name all the animals out there. He gave him all kinds of assignments, but that still was not fulfilling to him until he put him to sleep and he woke up and there she was. In fact, in the, in the Hebrew language, when he woke up uh, uh, from this deep sleep and saw this person, he was like, whoa, the, 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 the Hebrew word was wow. In many ways, you get the word woman, whoa, man. <laughs> just, just amazed. When God does surgery, he, you know, he, he put him to sleep. Just like when you, you get into a hospital and you have surgery, you have to go into a deep sleep in order to heal or fix something. In this sense, God knew that Adam needed to be fixed, and he did it through a woman, Okay? Her value in, verse, in chapter 31 is priceless. Um, in her, her re, the reason for her worth in, verse, in chapter 31, verses 11 through 12, it says her hu husband has confidence in her. She is the key to the success of this home and his life. Okay? Her life, it says in, in, in Proverbs 31, it says she's a hard worker. She's wise and industrious. In chapter 31, she's kind and generous. She always has time for other people, very giving. And then before, she's a benefit to the family. Now, you need to know that this Proverbs 31 was not written by Solomon. Neither was Psalm, uh, Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30 was written by Agur, A-G-U-R, Agur. And, and, and um, Proverbs 31 was written by a man named Lemuel, L-E-M-U-E-L, -E Lemuel. But, but Solomon wrote everything out, but not those last two. Now, remember what I was going to tell you about uh, Abigail in terms of the benefit to the family at 1 Samuel 25? Her foolish husband placed her house in jeopardy. Now, again, I don't have time to get all into the details of that. But she worked out the house is going to be destroyed by David because of, the, of what um, uh, uh, Nabal said to him. I mean, David did a whole lot of things to help him out around the house, and Nabal said something that was crazy. And David had all his men together. He was getting ready to destroy this house because of him, because of some of the things he refused to do. But Abigail, because she was a benefit to the family, stepped in and made a plea to David. And by that way, uh, David backed off from that. Now, Nabal came back home, says, one day from being drunk all night. He's, you know, he's crazy. He was drunk, he came home, and Abigail told him what was getting ready to take place. And Nabal, the Bible says in that chapter 25, he froze like ice. I mean, he was, he was just shook to the core because he knew his life and his family, his children, would have been destroyed. Okay? He was frozen stiff. And then 10 days later, the Bible says God took his life. You know, when you play with God, stuff going to happen to you. And then David went on and married Abigail. So it's just interesting how life turns. But her character, it says in chapter 31, she has strength and honor. Her character is wisdom. Uh, her character says she's busy and she watches over the affairs of the household. The results of such a life, it says in chapter 31, verses 28 through 29, is that her children will call her or rise up and call her what? Blessed. 
and her husband would do what? Praise her at the gates. Isn't that amazing? This is, this is this, this, this virtuous, virtuous woman, okay? So we've talked about husband and wife. We've talked about generosity and um, being, uh, you know, and all that and, and the home. Uh, now we're going to talk about the, the, the parent and the child. The, the task of, of training a child is, is, is the job uh, and the focus of the parents, according to uh, Proverbs 22, verse 6. It says, train up a child the way they should go. And you know the scripture. And when they are old, they will not, what, depart from it. Now, this verse tells us three truths. Now, what are these three truths? Number one is what we see, okay? It's three truths to what we see. Number one, what we see here is the task. In other words, train up. That's the discipline. Number two, we see action. What should go. That's the ideal, all right? Number three, we see the plan. The plan here is, well, what? They will not, what? Depart. That's the promise. God makes the promise to us that if we do our part, he will do his part. Now, they may be older in their 30s and 40s or 50s before they finally get it together, but God says that when you do your part, when you serve them the, the grits and the, and the gravy of the truth, you know, grits sticks with you, don't it? It, it sticks with you. It you know, in the same way, the truth of God is like grits, all right? It, in oatmeal, it just sticks with you all day long. And so the same way, you know, it, it, the word and what we teach, the values, no matter how far they depart, the Bible says, God says, that, that at some point, at some point, he'll pull them back, right? He'll pull them back, right? So, and also, and so the part of the home is discipline in terms of, of what we do and how we raise our children. Now, again, I got about five or ten minutes left. I can't get into the details, but I want to kind of get very briefly into this idea of the rod of discipline. You know, um, we, we say, well, you, you, you spoil, you spare the rod, you do what? That, that's not in Proverbs, by the way. Nowhere in the Bible, it was written in 1616 by an author of a book. But he was reflecting off of scripture about the rod and the discipline. Now, again, there are various views on this. I have a whole class I can teach on this. But you need to know what a rod was in biblical times. The rod was a long stick about this long. And it had a club at the end of it. And it was used for what? It was used by the shepherd to guide the sheep. He had a staff that pulled the sheep in when he wanted to run to, uh, wander off. So the, the, the club was used to kind of gently push them in. So when the scripture tells us in, 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 in Psalm 23, what? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Okay? Now, they comforted him because of what? The shepherd needed the, 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 the rod to protect the sheep against wolves to beat them off, and also to beat off other uh, enemies that would want to steal the sheep. So the sheep, I mean, the rod was used as a weapon, not discipline, but as a weapon. Now, you know, again, we, we'll get into other things like what the rod meant in terms of the metaphors of the Scripture. We talked about that earlier. We, there, there may be other things that you use, but you need to be careful that what you use is not destroying or physically abusing the child. Again, you discipline a child, Two, one or two reasons, for, um, for punishment and for correction, to deal with behavior or deal with mistakes. So as a parent, you've got to figure out, is what's happening here, is this a mistake that they made, or is this a rebellion? Now, based on one of those two things will determine how you, quote, unquote, discipline your child. Okay? Some of you all were beaten with iron cords hoses. Some of you were slapped in the face by your parents. There's a whole different discourse we can deal with. We don't have time to get into that. But there's the way you do things. The rod was metaphor for a certain type of discipline and correction. You don't take the three feet long rod that they use and actually beat a child with it. 
Now, it was used in terms of handling slaves. We don't want to get into all of that uh, back in the, in, in the Hebrew days. And Leviticus, Leviticus had a lot to say about you using a rod and beating a slave. Particularly, the rod was so strong, it would disfigure a slave or, would dis or kill him. And the rod says, and the Bible says, when you do that, you're going to have to compensate the owner of that slave for what you did and give them another one of yours. So, so there's a whole different context of how we use the word rod. So when you use that, be very careful. And I can do another seminar on it another time. Okay? Um, so again, in Proverbs 19, 18, uh, he says, discipline your child while there is hope. It says, do not be a willing party to their death. Proverbs uh, 19, verse 18. Now, you know, disciplining your child is very important because now there are legal issues uh, now with raising a child that will hold you as a parent responsible for their behavior. Okay? So that's why discipline is very important. You know, there is a trial just ending now in Michigan, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crumley. You've heard that story, right? Mr. and Mrs. Crumley, uh, their son shot and killed about four students in high school. And the parents were charged second-degree murder as a compliment to their child. Because there were things about him they should have known. They went out and maybe a few days before the murder and bought him a gun and some other stuff. So in many ways... You know, they were contributors to the death of those four those kids. And now, both of them have you know, tried to be guilty. They're guilty. And they're going to spend 15 years, up to 15 years in jail. So discipline is very important in your children, okay? Again, um, be careful, be careful, be careful, okay? Children, listen to your parents. Don't speak ill to your parents. Don't mistreat them. Uh, you know, pull your weight around the house. There is something that should be called division of labor in your household. Uh, division of labor. I know when I was growing up, uh, you know, one of my responsibilities was making sure that the TV set was clear. Some of y'all used to have what's called rabbit ears on your TV set. They didn't have the digital stuff now where everything is clear automatically. You, you had this kind of antenna on top of the TV, and I was responsible for making sure that it's clear. Because sometimes the, the screen would kind of revolve, right? Or it'd be kind of fuzzy. So I had to, you know, he'll call me in from outside. I'd be outside playing. And, uh, and my father would say, Barbara, go out there and get some down on. Come in and bring him in the house and straighten out this TV. I used to hate that. <laughs> but I was the only one that could do it. Sometimes we'd put, what, uh, aluminum foil on top of it, right? And then get some all kinds of reception on the TV. It was, it was all those kinds of things. I mean, I'd be coming in the house, I'd be stomping my feet. <clears throat> Why you got to have me to come in here? <laughs> uh, but that was a part of the labor. You know, part of the labor for me was, was snapping, you know, beans for my mama. She'd put them in the pot, and I would just be snapping. It was a part of building relationships with, with her. But that was a part of what I did, was snap them beans. And she'd cook them, right? Malachi 4.6 believes that there is a relationship between the child and the parents. And the father is so important that in the life of the Jewish nation was dependent upon it, and that the life of the children would depend upon how you treated your child. And if you didn't do that, God would place judgment upon your home. Malachi 4.6 tells us something about that, don't it? The last chapter and book in the, in the Old Testament. It says, he will turn the hearts of the father to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, or else I will strike the land with destruction. So, the, so your land, your community, your nation is dependent upon how the child is treating the parents and the parents treating the child. You wonder why some neighborhoods are messed up? Okay? We're getting ready to close. Give me one minute. One minute. They're telling me to stop. stop. What is wisdom? It reminds us that we are loved by God and that God never gives up on us. That's the wisdom of God. He knows and knows how bad you are, horrible you are, never give up on you. I was watching a TV movie, and an old woman whose husband had been missing in his home, he finally found his remains after 66 years. The grandson came over to the house and was getting ready to get rid of a bush that the father, uh, before he died, had, had planted in the backyard. And the mother, grandmother, said to the, to the grandson, what are, what are you doing? He said, Grandpa, he said, Grandma, look at that bush, it's dead. 
There's no life in that bush. The grandmother sat down next to it and said to him, you never know there may be life in those roots. And then one day it'll come back. She said, I never give up on things. And later in that movie, at the end, the movie began to pan out and the music began to fade. And the grandmother looks into the yard at the bush and on one of the branches there was a beautiful flower that was getting ready to grow on that one bush. This is how God sees us in his wisdom. He sees your life. He sees how messed up it is. He sees how contorted it is. But yet he knows deep down below there are roots that are good. And when others have given up on you, when others have washed their hands of you, God never gives up. Because he said he'll never leave you, nor will he forsake you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for the book of Proverbs. There's so much there and yet so little time. We thank you for what you've told us. Bless your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'm over time. Sorry about that. Come back next week. Break.